remember fires, um, cedar fire. Uh, Ron said he mentioned that, but uh, yeah, it was it was one for the books. I mean, it's it's one of those fires where you know it's point protection, um, going where you know where uh, where you think the uh, the fire's heading. There was no real direction. There was real no um, command system set up at that time. It was just real chaotic. Public rushing out and you're rushing in. Um, so we were just going to wherever people were making the announcements over the command channel and heading that direction. But it was day and night, it just all blended in together after that first 24 hours. It's just, you just feel that punch drunk kind of feeling after you've been up so long and you're trying to take cat naps and, and uh, kind of sustain yourself and, and keep going. But yeah, I, after the first 24, hours it just started blurring because after that it went into like three days <clears throat> just non-stop I mean that wind wouldn't let up it just kept going the first area we went into was a a uh, suburban area kind of rural area into the brushy area there <clears throat> the fire was backing on top in this uh, I can't remember who it was it wasn't the Forest Service I think it was like a city municipal person came to us, uh, gave us direction to start burning out and uh, try and save that community you know, that, that we were uh, assigned to and we looked at it and there was no way we could burn it. There was no lines, there was no, no place to tie it into and plus it was backing. It was kind of sheltered from the wind where it was at so it was doing nothing but good. So the backing fire was just slowly creeping back down. <clears throat> you know, you're only talking maybe half a chain, an hour slow slow rate of spread, not doing much. Fuel type was maybe, you know, three feet average. It's the chemise, the button brush type stuff. Um, but yeah, it, it's, so we, that's, that, that was our first kind of assignment. That was about one o'clock in the morning because we were released from a previous fire. So we just rolled into this one here. And that was our first assignment. So we kind of just took advantage of it, bedded down for a few hours, and then by four o'clock somebody else came up on the radio on the command channel, <clears throat> started talking, uh, uh, I think it was Viejas Casino area, Interstate 8, it's uh, east of San Diego. That's where uh, the fire was starting to push, making its push to the south. And uh, so we rallied everybody up, you know, shook their bags, went around, hey, we gotta go, um, let's go. And so we headed there, tied in with that battalion chief and he was I think a local right there in that Alpine I think that's Alpine the town of Alpine there and uh, he's the one who's giving us direction he gave us he actually gave a good brief what was going on gave us the layout uh, by that time uh, the sun was coming up um, but it was real smoky real hazy so it's kind of like a overcast day like but it was all smoke yeah just layered laid down um, so he gave us directions um, doing the same thing, uh, point protection around some communities. There was a uh, rain gutters on some of those communities. They have rain gutters on the back side, so it diverts the, the rain. So we kind of used that as, a, as our uh, line because it was all cement entrenched clear around this community. So it was pretty good. It was already done, so why do anything else? The only other thing we had to do was like go around door-to-door, to door, make sure everybody was out. Um, come to find out as the fire was approaching as we were getting ready to do the firing show um, there was people coming out like just waking up in their robes looking outside like you know with eyes as big as you know as the moon kind of just staring at that at that fire coming down and I, we were trying to get people back down hey you need to pack whatever you need whatever's important to you you have like five ten minutes put it in your car and get on the south side of interstate eight that's where you need to go right now because that fire is coming. So that was all within, I don't know, like 30 minutes or so trying to get those folks out and then the fire was on us. Um, it was pulsing down as it came down, it pulsed down towards us. And uh, as it started to feel that it didn't draft again, that's when we started lighting and it was maybe, I don't know, maybe 100 yards away from us. So we took advantage of that and started just from our uh, starting point, we just kind of just started anchored off each other using that cement trench and just using that piece all the way around. And that kind of went off fairly well, um, except for one of the guys that he had fusees instead of a drip torch. 
he was trying to light and was breaking all his fusees, so that kind of slowed one section down. But I mean, I remember that, and he had to take shelter behind uh, like a water tank. He really wasn't in that big of a danger because we already had fire coming towards him. But that's where he ended up saying, "Hey, I can't get this going. I'm just gonna have to just ride it out right here." And it wasn't that big of a deal, you know. You're only because our flame was going at it already. He was already pushing off maybe about five feet flame lengths. Same type of fuel type uh, that uh, chemise button brush type stuff with about three foot average. Uh, it was pretty good clearance around those homes. It wasn't that bad for until you got maybe a mile out or so. Then it was that thick, heavy, you know, Southern Cal California, just heavy brush. But, uh, you know, we went around him. He just, we picked him up as we went around the tank and he just jumped in line with us as we kept going. So it was a, a good thing. And it, that ordeal lasted from that call being at 4.30 in the morning until about 1 o'clock after we lit that whole thing off. And it felt like it was like an hour, like less than that. It went so quick, so fast. You're just, your brain's just running on high gear and you're just functioning at that level, you know, where you're, you're, you're just on, on top of everything, trying to just make sure everybody's safe. Um, and then the folks that were there, we had some uh, municipal folks with their Type 1 engines sitting there kind of just for the variety of us, they kind of backed off and went to the freeway. And they kind of thought we were nuts because that whole thing was just a big wall of flame coming at us. I mean, for like three mile stretch, as far as you can see, you know, east to west, this flame just rolling off the mountain. But it's, I think it's just understanding how fire burns and, and uh, knowing when to do what you got to do at the time and when it's right. Um, understanding when you get some of those cues from uh, just the wind direction, the weather itself. Um, watching your slow calm, the flames itself. You know, it's just watching the fire dance kind of across the, the landscape and as you feel what's right in time to light, and that's what we did. And uh, it, it, it was a uh, satisfying burn show that we did, that was good. But that's about the clearest thing I can remember after that, because soon after that we were headed to, God, what was that place? There's a town up top. I can't remember the town, but they said it, it, it's known for its pies, and it's on the Cleveland National Forest. And I know some of the Sioux, you know, down south, they know that place, you know, because they've been there on many of fires. <clears throat> but that's what they said, you know, save the pies. That's all I remember, save the pies. And that's where we ended up, and it, I can't remember the name of that town, but that, because once the winds died, that's where it came back up slope, and that's where we were, Julian, that's the name of the town. And uh, we were just, it was, the fire was coming all fronts, you know, south, west, north. And that's kind of where everybody rallied to because that's where the, the fire was coming back up slope. And, uh, but after that, it gets real vague. It's just, I just remember drinking coffee and one day and all these spots just landed all around us. And we had uh, media all around us, like right then and there because we were in Julian. It was just one of those things, it just all blended. It was just so... You know, it's just like, this isn't real, but it was, and you were in there. And that day, when all that happened, is when that fire laid down. It finally ran out of steam. It, you know, just the fuel type and a lot of the work that was done. Um, as on the backside, there was dozers pushing, because we knew it was kind of coming back up, and then they already had it kind of set up to, to catch it as it came around. And uh, basically just a lot of burning, but it was just... Three days of just, you know, just night and day, just all rolling into one. And uh, and there was homes lost, tanks, uh, propane tanks, oblivion. I mean, it was loud, and you could feel, you know, the, the concussion, the blast of it. And uh, and like I said, it was just rolling through communities, and you're trying to get people out because it's just coming. And you can't save everybody's home. You just got to get out of the way. And we tried a few times, and it, we lost our burn shows too because of it. I remember that much of it, and uh, and uh, yeah, it was just it was really chaotic that cedar fire for at least about three, four, up to about five days. It was just nonstop, just would not end. And I don't even remember the one thing I remember the most about that after we were relieved and went down to uh, it was some airport where they had ICP set up. And they bedded us down by this airstrip. And they shut down one airstrip, but they kept the other one active. And there was all those folks that were there saying, yeah, there was planes like 
uh, it's just a private, I guess, just a little public airstrip right there, not the big inter international stuff, but it was um, set up there, and uh, there was planes landing there all night, and I never even knew that's where we were at. We were literally laying maybe three feet from the, the you know, the, the airstrip, and then on the other side, another, I don't know, 50 yards or so is the other strip, and that's where they're landing planes. And we were sleeping right there. I didn't, until I woke up, and I'm like, oh, this is where we ended up. It was because of, it was just so, like I said, you're so wrapped up in that, and your brain's just working, and then once you get to that point where you just crash, and I hit, I maxed. And just waking up that next day, it was just, yeah, I felt refreshed when we woke up, but I just didn't realize how close we were to the airport and watching planes, because I just sat up, and then there goes a plane landing. I'm like, huh. It was just, it was crazy. I mean, it just all came to that one head, you know, that one point right there, and just, yeah, it was memorable. Thank <laughs> you.